Welcome back, everybody. Um, we're doing the seventh day of our tour of Firenze uh, painting tour, which has been absolutely wonderful. And we're in the square of Santo Spirito, which is across the Arno uh, from the main squares. And it happens to be a day in which there's many vendors out. You can see all the awnings. And um, I'm particularly caught by this woman who's dressed in red and selling these brightly colored fancy hats that are called fascinators. So I'm using her as a subject today to talk about composition. And uh, with composition, uh, we have a lot of things to talk about. This is just going to be an introduction. One of the more important things is center of interest, where is where do you want to guide the eye? Where do you want to tell the story? Where is your main focal area? You can see I've kind of diagrammed it here. A good place for a center of interest is not the center of the painting, but a little lower or a little higher. And uh, that's what I've done in this tonal study. You can see uh, the figures are coming out, darks against lights. A lot of um, interesting shapes around that center of interest. The background is rather subdued. The foreground uh, supports the center of interest. And uh, those are my thoughts when I'm composing. This happens before the painting really takes off. We give some thought to arrangement and balance of the composition. And uh, there's many things that can help us with composition, and I'll touch on a few today. In this case, um, uh, one thing that helped me was to decide on that center of interest. And from that center of interest, I was able to fashion a, uh, a drawing based on uh, what would be called uh, the cross. It's a compositional stem that uh, has been around for a long time and it's a way to bring stability to your painting. There's many compositional stems and I touch on them uh, in the PDF that accompanies this tutorial and uh, you can download that from my website that, that uh, has this page of Santo Spirito You'll see it on that page and you can download it. That explains in greater detail and with some examples um, what compositional stems are and how they're useful, especially in working on location. And they're useful because they help you to organize your idea. They help you to organize all that visual information that's in front of you into a, a simpler um, statement. And that simpler statement becomes easier to paint. It makes the job a little easier. That's the big value of uh, any study in composition is it helps you to simplify your subject, make your subject more readable and understandable to your audience. Um, so the painting is underway. I've stated the, actually my brighter shapes, my more important shapes initially with that yellow ochre, uh, creating the statue of, I'm not sure, but I want to say it's Dante again, uh, who's got, and this time he's kind of got a sour look to him. He's got his arms folded. He's looking down on the crowd. Of course, this is a really nice uh, study in perhaps human psychology or... Uh, the ability of human human beings to commu communicate uh, things in your painting. So our three figures, maybe it's a trinity, maybe it's, uh, I'm not really thinking along those lines, but certainly threes are a good number to be using in painting. Uh, and they do form sort of a triangle, if you're familiar with Raphael's compositions, the classic Renaissance painter. He used the triangle almost exclusively um, to create balance and composition in his paintings. This is not by any means a takeoff on, on that idea. This is, in the end, you'll see this forms a slightly different, uh, is relying on a slightly different compositional stem, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Anyway, at this moment, I'm developing the center of interest 
Um, I'm going at it rather early in the painting. It doesn't, you know, each painting has a little different course. And I found it helpful for me to kind of establish these figures since they're going to be the center of interest and there's a lot of lights surrounding these figures, I found it helpful for me to establish them early. Um, I placed that deep foreground to lead up to the figures, that a strong blue, uh, ultramarine blue mixed with a little bit of perhaps um, neutral tint or a little warmer color to gray it. And uh, that forms the foreground of the painting. This is um, basically a shadowed area in front of our subject. And this is um, taking care of the foreground. What I'm painting now is, well, we'd call it the background. Um, I'm using a lot of warm tones to create the feeling of the um, shadowed side of the building. We're looking at a building directly in front of us not at an angle. So it's a rather flat background, but the light is bouncing up into the background, which is why I'm working so hard to uh, generate a dark near the bottom where it meets the awnings and letting it be a little brighter on top. This is hopefully going to result in a feeling of light bouncing back up into the buildings. But it's, it's a, a dark middle tone. In fact, this this uh, value pattern that I'm creating relies on a dark foreground and a relatively dark background, which we would I identify as a middle tone, uh, with a strong uh, passage through the midground of lights to help set um, our center of interest and give us focus on those two characters. I believe they're engaged in a, some sort of transaction here. Um, the woman in black has obviously found a fascinator that she likes, and the salesman is working hard to finalize the sale. You can see bits of color and a hat hanging on the table. These are to make the scene look a little more festive because it truly was a, a festive area with all sorts of vendors in the square, selling vegetables, selling products from their farms, selling antiques, selling uh, souvenirs. Um, the marketplace is a great place to take your easel or your sketchbook and sit for a few hours and draw the, the scenes that unfold in front of you. This was definitely <laughs> a scene that unfolded in front of me. You see me now identifying the awnings with a similar uh, palette, a dark mid-tone, and I'm working close to that table, leaving a few highlights um, in the distance, which will translate in the end, they'll, they'll translate into the tops of heads or objects on a table, but they're not painted that way. They're painted as just little broken lights um, with a strong darks surrounding them. So I'm working closer now to the center of interest. So my brush size has gotten a little smaller. Uh, the palette is a little brighter and I'm, I'm still trying to keep a, a rhythm to the brushwork. What that means is I'm not slowing down to take care of details in this area. I'm trying to keep it fresh feeling and um, uh, rather abstract. That's a good way, a good term to use here is I'm not letting myself really get caught up in the details as of yet. If I'm going to explore the details, they're going to be um, within my figures. So, okay, the painting is starting to get, uh, is starting to come together. By that, I mean the mid-tone is established uh, around some light areas and uh, the main focal area is coming out. Um, it's time to add some darks and some more details uh, around the table, around the center of interest. Um, with the composition, you wanna do, you wanna give some thought before you start your painting. Um, this this thought process can be simply cerebral. You can kind of look at your subject and consider 
uh, what sort of compositional stem might work here, or you might consider what does uh, what am I going to leave out, what am I going to keep in. Um, these are thoughts that you can also deal with in your sketchbook. I find it really helpful to either sketch or do this monotone painting before I start. It doesn't take a lot of time and it helps me to warm up and it also helps me to resolve some of the compositional ideas. So you notice that I give a lot of attention to um, doing these tonal studies and that's the reason. Uh, it's multi-purpose but it helps me to resolve the composition or it helps me to generate um, a composition and uh, so I find it a very useful tool. Sometimes they turn out to be nice little paintings all by themselves. So the lights have gotten more and more refined in this painting. Uh, the passage of light is very important to me, how it's coming over the tops of the awnings and creating a, a strong diagonal behind the hat, behind our figures, across the pavement. Those angles are crucial to me. Number one, they describe the light, but they also help lead us. Uh, we have a term called leads, uh, which are basic. Uh, leads means uh, the edges of shapes or lines within the painting that direct your attention. They direct your attention wherever you want it to go. In this case, I have this strong passage of light um, moving towards the figures and on both sides, actually, down the awning on the right-hand side or across the pavement on the left-hand side. There's also a strong light in this severe statue of Dante looking down on the no, I'm calling him Dante in truth, I don't know. Um, so I have to do some research. Anyway, this statue is looking downward, but the light passage on the front of the statue forms a line that moves your eye in the direction of the fascinator. And the tabletop light, another line that intersects that vertical line, um, also directly behind the fascinator. So there's a lot of little things that can be used to uh, move your audience through the painting. And all this is kind of set in motion by what you identify as your center of interest. So that's a very important stage to face in your painting. A good question to ask yourself is, what do I want to say in this painting? What do I want my audience to take away from this painting? What is interesting to me about this scene? The answer to the question usually leads you to your center of interest. In this case, it was fairly obvious that the transaction between the fascinator and her customer was what interested me. And so the, the light certainly helped in this case. Uh, some of the lines in the, audience, in the awnings helps me. Certainly the arrangement of tonal values is presented, maybe exaggerated, to spotlight the fascinator and um, in this painting. So these are thoughts that enter my mind as I'm doing a tonal study or as I'm uh, thinking about my painting. And this actually precedes the, the performance of the painting. And I find that uh, that separation to be helpful to me. And I, I, I put that forth as a technique. In other words, uh, do your thinking, do your planning, do your decision making as much as you can before you start your painting so that you can give more attention to what's going on with uh, the watercolor. The watercolor, as we know, is a it's a media that is based on timing many time uh, many passages you need to get done within a certain amount of time so you feel this rush um, as you're painting and to try and juggle compositional ideas and make those decisions as you're painting usually ends up not so good so making those decisions through a sketch or tonal study or simply by thinking about it before you paint is very, very helpful. And 
it's relaxing too. It calms you. It calms you before you get into the painting so that you're a little more confident and a little more sure about what your steps are going to be, where you're going to bring focus and attention. And it helps you to also to uh, go back and adjust certain areas. If an area is too bright or taking away from the center of interest, or if there's, um, for some reason, a, a distraction in some part of the painting, you can adjust that later. So we're coming down to the final stages in this painting. Um, not a lot has, certainly there's been more details added, more highlights, um, more suggestions of, of clothing and uh, things on the tabletop. Our statue of Dante is, got, is coming out from the background a little more. Uh, you noticed uh, previously I painted the windows into the wash that had dried behind the statue. They were painted very loosely with a single color to not draw you back there. Um, they were certainly attractive in their own right, but I tried to keep it simple and at the same time bring about that beautiful decorative quality that uh, all the architecture in Florence has. In particular, some of these squares are just beautiful. And it's real easy to get lost in that. So uh, in my mind, I'm thinking to keep them simple and descriptive, but not um, taking away too much from this mid-ground, my center of interest. And I'm struggling a little bit with this statue. You could probably notice that. Uh, he's, uh, he's lost some of his uh, strength, so I'm going back in and fortifying some of the edges, working behind him with a little more dark into that window uh, to, to bring it out just a little more. And this is the stage where you want to be, you certainly want to finish things to your plan, but it's easy to over finish also. So another discipline that I try to adhere to when I'm painting is I try to finish the painting or step away from the painting, let's say before it's really finished and give myself a chance to look at it the next day or the next over the next few days and decide if I want to add anything or refine anything. This is especially true where you're <clears throat> looking at your painting, you feel that something's not quite right, uh, something's off, but you're not sure what it is. Reflection is good for that. Well, here's the finished painting. Basically, I placed a, a texture into the foreground. You can see that pattern of tiles. This was a, a great way to lead in. But you notice a green cross, and this is the compositional stem that holds the painting together. Let's look at the painting without the cross, and you can see that that statue is a strong vertical, and it meets a strong horizontal in the tabletop. And this is actually exactly where our fascinator is. So that's our painting for today. And as I said, you can uh, download a tutorial that explains compositional stems in more detail. Um, it presents some other compositional ideas as well from my website, as well as a materials list. Thank you for watching.